this next presentation I'm actually very excited about as well. Um, it is going to be facilitated by Kim Shirobi. Uh, her responders are Fritjof Bergman. How many of you saw Fritjof Bergman this morning? All right. So Fritjof Bergman, uh, Re Roberto Mendoza, Judah Snow, Sterling Tolls, and Shane Bernardo. So give them a round of applause. Why are you culture? Good afternoon, everyone. Of course, Tawana just told you, we're talking about why new culture. And I just want to go ahead and get started um, with asking you, a, or really I should say, um, making a couple of general statements about our current culture, um, the culture here in the United States, and really broad in many ways. So I'm going to make uh, some general statements about the culture, and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you pretty much agree with what I said. Okay? So, our culture today um, is one that is one of greed, a lot of distrust, violence, oftentimes exclusion, consumerism, militarization, and shame and blame. So if you pretty much agree with that statement, raise your hand. I want you all to look around the room just to get a sense of how people are feeling, just to get a temperature. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, if this culture that I just described is working for you, <laughs> raise your hands. Again, I want you to take note around the room. So I can go now. We know, we know why the culture because it's not working for any of us, right? It's really not working for most, I should say, it's, just, it's not working for most of us. So, uh, shortly, our panel is going to share a little bit about what they've been doing uh, in their uh, practices to change the culture or even to share some of their thinking. Um, but before they do that, I want to emphasize when I talk about, when I say new, when I refer to the new part of culture, what I'm really referring to is not something that's always new. Because in some of these practices and things that I'm going to talk about, you'll find that they've been past traditions and past practices. But what is new is a new awareness, a new appreciation uh, for these things and a new commitment for the way that we really want to be. And that's what is new. So you'll hear, because I've often heard people say, well, that's not new, I've done that before. But maybe where we are in our thinking is um, definitely a little different. So what I, I mean, um, new, I should say, in terms of awareness, appreciation, and commitment. So I'm going to uh, start off, I'm just going to go down the row here. And I'll start with Chris Shaw and let him make some comments if that's okay with you. And each person will introduce themselves. Uh, we'll take each person will take about five minutes, and then we'll um, open it up to audience and have some conversation. You want to pick up, please? I think there are many, many, many reasons why the culture under which we suffer now is not just not working for us, but it is destructive, destructive in innumerable ways. Kim did ask the question, well, if I heard you right, what are we trying to do? To improve that, to change that, to make a culture that would, I don't know about work for us, but much more than that. In, in my thinking about this panel right now, it occurred to me that really, all in all, we haven't had a culture so far. Everything we have so far done was botched. Uh, the cultures we created did not 
make us more alive. And that's the least the culture can do. The culture should make us more alive, should make us live more intensely than we would without that culture. One sentence I use quite a lot is the idea of burning the violins. You know, burning the violins like we burn everything. We burn everything under the big fire of our economy, of our greed, of our wealth, of our productivity, <coughs> of producing ever more at an ever greater speed. But all of that involves burning the violins, burning the culture. I mean burning the violins as a metaphor for burning the culture. No end of things we used to have as part of our culture, from ways of celebrating to ways of dancing together, to ways of praying together, to ways of raising children, to ways of celebrating marriage. I grew up in a village in which Christmas took two months of celebration. A funeral was at least three weeks of total drunkenness of the whole village. <laughs> That's a culture. <laughs> so, my feeling comes down to something which I'm sure many of you know anyway. That is, I think the best I can do to somehow help us into a culture that will give us more life, that will not drain us, that will not burn us, but that will make us more alive than we are now, and that will make our life more meaningful than we are. Frankly, it is, to my mind, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. It is new work. That is especially the part that tries to help everybody not just an elite, but everybody to discover something that they deeply and seriously want to do. That I think helping people to find out something to which they are utterly committed, which they are not ashamed of, which they would do rather than anything else. To help people to do that, to create a culture that will assist people towards doing things they really want to do. I think maybe that is, to my mind, for what I'm worth, it's the best we can do to create a culture that we deserve instead of the culture that right now punishes us. I will quote something that I have hardly ever quoted before, and I hope you don't mind my quoting it. I once was on a panel with the Dalai Lama, and of course I was frightened out of my skull. <laughs> and uh, right around the point at which his turn to talk came, and he was of course the last speaker, he said, helping people to find out what they really, really want is the most spiritual sense he had ever heard. I think there's some truth in that. So I would leave you with that. <coughs>
profound way to change someone is just allowing them to see you in the process of your own change. Um, so I think we, we look at the world, we look at culture, and we say there are a million things wrong with it. But in a sense, I, I feel like it, it's the same as our body saying this it sends us signals of pain to let us know that something isn't working properly. Therefore, it's working properly to let us know, hey, you're doing something that's not healthy, change it. And so I think what we see in terms of culture is just a reflection of uh, the illness of our collective relationships to one another. And one thing I, I constantly think about, people probably hear, have heard me say many times is, I don't believe there's a such thing as a social problem. There are only internal problems that play out socially. And so everything that we experience uh, from one another is just a reflection of what's happening in internally. So even in which I think how we frame injustice, uh, how we frame uh, war, pain, strife is just something I think that we need to shift the language of in a way because, uh, in a way in which because uh, we have an opportunity in seeing what's happening socially to shift it through our own relationship to it. And what I mean by that is, really we have a physical body, but our true body is the body of our experience which encompasses everything and everyone. So sometimes we find ourselves in situations that seem challenging or hurtful or unfair, and we get angry or we get frustrated or we get mad. But in actuality, I look at it as this is the part of our collective anatomy in which we've been assigned to heal. And so now the circumstances in here to afflict us, it is that we are the healer that this crystallization of our collective pain has arrived at for us to now bring it to a place of health. So we are not a reflection of the circumstances, we are the health that the circumstances have arrived at to become whole again. So our collective wholeness lies in our ability to actually love the circumstances that we're in. And we can heal each part of our collective anatomy one circumstance at a time that we find ourselves in. So essentially, I do feel it's all beautiful because so often we, we negate our power to, to actually uh, tap into the potential for love and healing and everything. So it's just like me, I also do visual art. And if you take paint away from me, it's like, well, I'll paint with ketchup. You take ketchup away from me, I'll use this board to create. You take this board away from me, as long as there's anything tangible there, we have the ability to, to bring into fruition the nature of our heart. And so therefore, the substance of injustice is weak, therefore, pliable anyway. You know? But I think ultimately, uh, it comes down to our belief. And it's, we want justice, we want healing, we want love, but do we really believe it's possible? Because the threshold to that coming into fruition has to be wider than what it is we want to be ushered into existence. So if the threshold of our belief is smaller than what we want to actualize, it's never gonna fit into our reality. And I feel like so many things begin with the expansion of our belief to accommodate ushering the things that we really wish to seek into existence uh, into reality. Thank you.
Today is a good opportunity to say other things I don't usually say. And I want to emphasize that we're talking about culture. Or what is the culture? And I don't know really for sure what a culture is, but I understand the culture to be a way that an identifiable group of people choose to take care of themselves and to pass the life on to the next generation, to celebrate, to mourn, and to otherwise keep their community together. And so by that kind of definition, we already have a very curious development going on because you can hardly say that there's an identifiable group of people in the world anymore. We are a global phenomenon. And we're not defined by our river or our mountains or by our skin color or by our language or any of those things anymore. We are global. But we are already doing something that has never been done before. And I don't know if that could ever be said too many times, because there's a tendency to want to look backwards and say we're trying to fix something. And if we fix it, it'll all go well. That is absolutely not true. <laughs> because this has not been done before. And we actually are creating a new way for human beings to be on the planet. Now obviously we have some precedents that we can examine to help us make better decisions. But that doesn't mean we can go back and fix anything. We must be who we are now and move forward, which is pretty much what these gentlemen have been saying. Right? Um, the other thing that really is new um, in the world is that it's impossible for us to come at a new culture from the perspective of the individual. And yet we have to honor our individuality. We haven't really figured that out yet. But in the way past, there was no such thing as an individual. You were born into a role. You grew up into that role. If you survived your adulthood, you played out that role and you died in that role. You were not an individual. And then capitalism, or money, let's say, not. money arrived. Money was a solution to an interesting problem. The interesting problem being that many different cultures wanted to be able to work with each other. And we figured out a way to exchange stuff, which we never had to do before. Um, so money created the individual because money created a world where we turned ourselves into machines in order to make stuff. And you all know this stuff, but I'm just reminding you that the actual presence of the sense that I, Judith, am an individual in the world was an impossible sentence, an impossible thing to say 400 years ago. It just didn't exist. And then, for a while, that's all there's been. And we've been utterly unaware of each other, imagining that it's all about us as individuals. And now we see that, as the women in the previous panel pointed out many, many ways, many times, it's impossible for us to live as individuals. You just can't. I am not the same person with Sterling than I am with Miranda, or than I am with Irwin. I put Irwin and Miranda together, and I'm a different person. I'm just not really an individual. It never happened. It's an illusion. So we
we are now trying to figure out how do we do both. And one of the consequences, as the previous gentleman said, of doing that is that we recognize that each of us has the opportunity, the possibility of bringing something different, a special way of working in the world, an individual gift or talent, something that drives us with passion that we can bring into the culture. That was never here before. Even 40 years ago, you could have said such an incredibly cra crazy thing as that somebody could want and have passion to do something in the world. It's, it's just literally, you, you don't realize that you could have said that sentence. You know, 40 or 50 years ago. Or maybe a few people could, but not everybody. <laughs> So we're creating something that has not ever existed. Now we actually have examples of the new creation all around. And one of the reasons I come to Detroit year after year to this conference is because Detroit has so many examples of people creating ways to live with each other that are actually beginnings of a real culture that will work in the world, both locally and globally. So celebrate yourself and keep on. Keep it up, because the whole world is learning from Detroit. Thank you. My name is Roberto Mendoza. My mother is Native American uh, from my Greek tribe, Muscovy. My father is a Chicano, or his people are from Mexico, but he's a mixed blood. Mexican, most Mexican people are mixed blood, Spanish and Native indigenous people. Anyway, <clears throat> I, wa I wanted to address some questions that I had in my own mind. And one of the things that I saw when I, when I saw that we need to talk about culture I decided we needed to go a little bit deeper than just culture. We have to look at where does culture come from? What is it based on? And what, it, what I've come up with is that it's based on a set of values. And those values are what are like the, the, the foundation of culture. Uh, as Ken pointed out, capitalism has certain kinds of values that are extremely negative. Individualism, competition, uh, lack of reciprocity, they take, always take it, they're never giving back. So they accumulate, you know, materialism. And those values are really very destructive. And they're reaching a point in this time on the clock of the world where they threaten life on the planet. The planet itself will continue, but life may it not be destroyed completely, may be very, very much uh, cut back and Millions of people may die. Already, millions of animals and species, whole species, are dying. They call this the sixth great extinction. And this is the, the first extinction that is caused by human activity and capitalist values. So we need to go and look at, well, what kind of values are going to underlie this new culture we're talking about? Now, as a native person, I like the values, a lot of the values that we've come up with because they, they seem to be the opposite of capitalist values. You know, we don't talk about individualism, we talk about the group, how we care about our people. And we don't talk about greed, we talk about generosity. We, we appreciate that in a person. And you can just go down the list of capitalist values and ours is almost always the opposite. But I, as, a, as a person living in this time in the top of the world, you know, I realize that um, Native values have also kind of infiltrated the, the, the people in this country over the last 500 years. And it comes out through, like, the science of ecology. 
scientists, who were mainly, of course, white, came up with the concept of ecology, but Native people would say to themselves, well, we already knew that. We already knew that we were all connected, that we are all related. We have a saying, all my relations. That's ecological. So, to, to a large extent, the environmental movement discovered sometimes on their own, but sometimes also by working with indigenous people, you know, the, what the kind of values that make life sustainable in this, in this world. And so, and I've been in the, involved in different movements since the 60s. You know, and that's a, a native, a native elder said from, the, from this vantage point of the high hill of my old age, you know, I can see certain things. And one of the things that I've seen over the past 40 years or so in my activity is that there are certain things that we didn't really understand back in the 60s, so we made lots of mistakes. Well, we did a lot of good things too. You know, women's liberation, gay liberation, native liberation, all these groups. And we actually passed some good laws in the short time that we had. And now, of course, they're trying to take those, take those all back. There's a counter-revolution going on. But one of the things that I no, noticed when I was younger, when I was a member of the American Indian Movement, and I went to a little reservation where my wife, ex-wife was, and I tried to start a group there, and it, it, wouldn't, it didn't go. It fell apart. And I didn't quite understand why until later when I got involved in another group, the co-counseling group, which uh, is kind of like a healing group. They talked about what they call internalized oppression. And they explained clearly what it was and how it operated. But the most important thing they explained is that you can step out of those patterns of behavior. You don't have to keep, you know, perpetuating, perpetuating oppressive uh, actions and patterns of behavior that you might have in your own self. So I started recognizing it in myself and in my community. Because she pointed out, she, the woman that sort of started talking about this in that community was a black woman. And she pointed out what was happening in the black community. All of the internalized oppression. People putting each other down, you know, calling each other names, calling, stuff like calling each other nigger. That's part of their, their internalized oppression. And of course, among Native people calling each other redskins or skins, that's our internalized oppression. You know, but every group has some kind of internalized oppression. And it's worse depending on how much the oppression they have. You know, it's less among whites, upper middle class people, but it's still there. But it's also much worse than among poor oppressed people that are black or Latino or native. And you can see it just in the statistics alone. Shorter lifespans, more of our people in jail, more, more levels of addiction, alcoholism, even stuff like diabetes, you know, which I have. So what, it, what became clear to me is that it, I looked at our movements and I saw, I began to see patterns of internalized oppression in our movements that stopped our movements from growing, that divided us, and caused them to implode or to turn into something worse than what they started out with. Because they were not conscious of that, what, how the process of internalized oppression starts. It starts with an oppressive system, capitalism. But we unconsciously adapt those values of capitalism, the ideology of capitalism, without even thinking about it. And because we think it's the way things always were, and that's, there's no alternative. And, and, and now I realize, of course, there is alternatives, but I had to go through that struggle to see. And I see, still see enormous amounts of eternal oppression now, which threaten our movements. And I think it's, we have to become really clear on how the, the negative messages and negative value systems of the system, the capitalist system, unconsciously parasitize our thinking. So when you talk about decolonizing our minds, that's part of getting rid of that stuff. Because I, I've been in groups where there's been leaders who came in and just basically were egotistical, power hungry, manipulative, and they just destroyed and divided the movements. And that can still happen if people are not aware of that process. So I can't go too much in a lot of detail about it, but I suggest that you Google internalized oppression. There's a bunch of articles about it. It's been spreading around the, the world, it could be how to understand that concept. But if you could get that clear in your thinking and then you look at it and how it operates even in yourself, you will we'll have a better chance of making our, keeping our movement stronger. 
because the system uses our entire life question against us. An example is in the 60s, the Black Panther Party was sent a message from another black group, black power group, and they ended up shooting each other. That's internalized oppression. And they, they know, they don't quite understand it themselves, but they know how to use it when they see it. And they try to, they try to encourage that in our movements by spreading rumors, by uh, all kinds of ways of just causing divisions and fights among our people. And we have to really have to be able to deal with that if we're going to succeed. Even revolutions, an example like the Russian Revolution. Lenin thought he had this great, these great ideas, and they were very powerful. They were very clear about how to get out of capitalism. But he, wasn't, he was unconscious that some of the same value system of capitalism were still in his thinking. Authoritarianism. That only a certain uh, elite group had the answers. Master, what they call master thinking. And Stalin, when he got into power, he started saying, he started seeing enemies everywhere. And that's why there's so many people ended up in the gulags, you know, or in China, after Mao, they ended up in re-education re camps. You know, that's internalized oppression in the, in, a, in the communist movements. But every movement can fall victim to those. You know, there are so many liberation movements in Africa and Latin America, and all of them had some level of internalized oppression. And the more they had it, the less successful they were. So that's, some, that's something I keep really wanting people to, to look at and address and deal with because it's the single greatest obstacle to making our movies strong. As, as Abu Carter would say, you know, we have many enemies, but the greatest single enemy is internal. I, I, I misquoted I miss him, of course, but that's what, I, what I'm trying to get to you is that the greatest enemy we have is that it can be in ourselves. And it's because it's unconscious. But once we make it conscious and we figure out ways to heal ourselves from that, stepping out of those negative patterns, then we reclaim our power. Thank you, and thank you for that.
coming condition as wage labor is this healthy sense of questioning, right? And that is essential to becoming more human, right? And rehumanizing our connections to one another, uh, rehumanizing our connection to the earth and other forms of creation. Uh, case in point, I was driving to, uh, to work the other day with my mom. And <laughs> um, my mom noticed that I was going with facial hair. <laughs> and I know I look young, but I'm a little bit older than what you think. And for most of my life, I've had this baby face. And so I started getting patches of hair in places where I couldn't get them before. So I was like, this is cool. <laughs> I'm going to let this grow out some and see where it goes. And so, mostly this hair is a product of indecisiveness. <laughs> um, and thankfully I work at a place that doesn't put a lot of, um, I guess, value in how you work. Um, which I really think you're good for. But, uh, getting back to my mom, and my, my mom was like, uh, I told her I, I was speaking today on, on this panel, and my mom, my mom uh, says, well, Shane, why don't you shave? <laughs> You look more presentable, and people will respect you more. And here comes this uh, this healthy questioning back in my head. And I was like, "Wow, how does someone who's known me my whole life, that birthed me, that carried me for nine months, still doesn't see me behind this facial hair?" And so there. <laughs> There's, there's, a, there's a trick, right, it is to understand how um, intimacy or the, intimacy, uh, the level of intimacy in our relationships with one another can then be the viscosity in which we start to explore new culture that are incredibly intertwined and interbound with history around um, colonialism, U.S. imperialism, um, um, I got notes here, and religious missionary work. Um, I was brought up Catholic, and that's one other story. Um, so I, I work here in Detroit around uh, different issues, around food justice, equitable development. I'm also a youth worker. I work with uh, Detroit Asian Youth Project. Um, and uh, also a media maker and oral historian. And uh, did I mention anti-racism work? <laughs> Not yet. It's all it's, it's all interconnected. And when you start activating this healthy sense of questioning and apply it to these systems of oppression that Roberto talked about, you start to understand how we've been compartmentalized and disconnected from our own humanity and dignity. So really at the basis of all the work that I just mentioned is reclaiming our sense of humanity and dignity. And you're gonna to come to a point where you start to uncover some of these internal structures that are inside of us that prevent us from doing so, right? And so just like my mom, she introduced me to a skewed fragmentation of myself it wasn't even me. It was deeply rooted in her life's experiences and her ancestors before her. It had nothing to do with it. Um, so when we, when we talk about ourselves and our relationships and sometimes the labels that we place on one another, we have to be really careful about the, our language. Language means a lot. Language is symbolic of how we've been conditioned. And if you pay attention to how we refer to one another, a lot of the labels and categories that we place ourselves in are based on market, market terminology. And um, I'll just offer some. Um, homeless, uh, disabled, um, unemployed. You know, what does that really have to do? That's such a narrow definition of a person, of, of your humanity. Um, it doesn't bear, it doesn't offer any inkling into any of the other gifts that you may have as, as an individual. 
And in this process of recon reconciling this historical trauma, um, in the process of reconciling this historical trauma, we start then to see how these inner conflicts are reflected in our immediate environment. It's reflected in our language and how we talk about the, our, our immediate surroundings. When we talk about a vacant parcel of land, when we talk about uh, a peopleless house, when we talk about desolate areas in, in post-industrial Detroit that is a, a mecca for urban decay, now, that's all deeply rooted in some of these internal struggles that we have as people. Gracie Boggs uh, said something, uh, and I'm paraphrasing that uh, a vacant land, a vacant parts of land, uh, is potential for a cultural revolution, right? And so, within that, in analyzing that 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 uh, that quote, we really have to understand the way in which we behave often is deeply rooted in. A lens of scarcity, right? In seeing ourselves without, seeing ourselves as lacking. And so here is the work of new culture, is coming from a sense of abundance. That the answers that we seek are really not external to us, external to our communities. A lot of times when we talk about these social issues, a lot of times we only get so far as addressing the symptoms, and that that that's what allows colonialism to, to take 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 place, gentrification, uh, land grabs, and a lot of the other things, privatization around our natural resources. It's all deeply embedded in the way we see the world. I'm gonna okay. Um, so some of the work that I, I'm involved in here is uh, food justice and growing food and celebrating food and urban farming. And so urban farming to me is a, uh, a living metaphor for spiritual endeavor. Mm -hmm. To re-spirit ourselves, to, take, to reclaim our spirits, and reclaim the true purpose of our spirits. And so in, in reme remediating soil, we're also reconciling our relationship to the food that we place in our body and the earth that provides it. Um, let's see here. I got some good ones here. So Shane, can I have you share those good ones with everybody else, maybe later on when they ask some questions? Because we have about 15 minutes, oh, if you yeah, don't mind. Yeah. So I do want to open this up to the audience. If you all have any questions or comments that you want to make, we'll take some, because we have about, about 15 minutes, 12 minutes, before we wrap this session up. Excuse me, Shane, thanks. Anybody? And make life 
equal and just for all people. So I just wanted to put it out. that exist cross-culturally and cross-civilizations, especially between Islam and the Western world, and the amount of rhetoric that's happening even now, what role can this institution, this group, disseminate to help mend the divide and temper the storm? I would like to see that happen. I would be willing to help work on it too. 
if we decide to do that. See, um, I have to travel a great, great deal and in the process, more and more, I discover that the world over, roughly, there are about 20% of the people who live in comfort, and 80% of all the people on the planet live on the edge of poverty or inside of poverty, going down fast. Now, it is a fact that among the 80% of the people who are destitute, the stuff we are talking about is spreading faster than you can imagine. Because they know that they need something like this and they ask for it and they insist on it and they do battle for it. So, yeah, I think it will spread very fast. The 80% will make it spread very fast. The 20% will be astonished. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some people that are uh, identified one, two, but I do want to say something also as it pertains to that, besides uh, what uh, Shane is doing, thank you. Um, those of you all who have time and want to join us and tell us, please do so. So it, it does take people, it does take time, talent, and um, energy to make things happen. So I want to throw that out there. Yeah, so, so to talk about culture, I feel music is a really important part of culture. Um, and when you look back at the social movements of the 60s, a lot of really popular artists in the 60s had very revolutionary messages that were helping people to develop their consciousness and wake up and join the movements. And I feel like with, you know, there's a lot of great music today with great messages, but not reaching large numbers of people a lot of the time. Uh, you know, with popular music a lot of times, you know, we see that internalized oppression, like the music is glorifying money or objectifying women. So I just wanted to ask, how can we you know, bring that sort of consciousness or you know, lift up music and popular culture that is going to bring people into the movement, bring young people Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I actually, uh, I produce music and work with a lot of artists in the city. Um, actually, I think like this is the worst time ever for the music industry. This is the greatest time ever for music. <laughs> right now. Um, I work with so many youth that everything that's on their iPod and stuff that's not on the radio, right? And I feel like in a lot of ways, especially when you think of popular music and for the last 30 years, in a sense, popular music has kind of been ruled by what people call hip hop. I really feel like commercialized hip hop has kind of functioned as almost like the, the little brother for the big brother. What I mean by that is, it's like the big brother gets the little brother to say a whole bunch of stuff that he feels, but the little brother takes all the rap for it, right? <laughs> the little brother gets in trouble for it, but the little brother is just arc articulating the sensibilities of the bigger brother, right? And so the misogyny, the oppression, all of that is the stuff that we've learned. You know, like one of the uh, young artists I, I once worked with, like she has a, a very popular song right now. And she has a line in the song that actually says, um, I hate N-words, I'm a Nazi, right? It's like, whoa. <laughs> but, I mean, if you listen to so much of that, it's like, it's that internalized oppression, right? Uh, what's, what's, what's beautiful now is that the internet allows people to connect to what they want to connect to, right? But so many people's sensibilities are plugged into that, that mass popular culture that, that, that we know, right? So I think now it's just a matter of people sharing uh, music. I mean, if, you, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter or whatever else, it's like amazing how one person can cite a song on Twitter that a lot of people follow 
And then two weeks later, that, that video has a million more hits on YouTube. So I think in a sense, it's our obligation. You guys listen to music. If something moves you, a sentiment in the song moves you, make sure you share with people. Because more people will find out about it that way. And so really, now it's become a community thing. It's a matter of sharing now. Because the beautiful thing is that corporations can't necessarily control what gets in the hands of people now. So a person in their bedroom can make a song and upload it. And in two weeks, three million people have seen that video. So our sentiments of love and joy and justice, all of that now is at the fingertips of, of everybody throughout the world. And that's a very, 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 very uh, powerful position for us to be in. So I say share it. Share it. Be vigorous in sharing sentiments, not just music, that can actually affect the, the, the current of the culture. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're, we're past our time, but I did promise this gentleman in the green shirt to get his question. And then Judith is going to make one statement, and then the next person um, on the panel or the program is going to come up. So, did you have a kind of a question? Yes, I do. I told him about oh, I forgot. I, I know. I just remembered. Okay. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, so, when you're, when you're working on organizing for an advocacy campaign, sorry. when you're working on organizing for an advocacy campaign, you know, around any sort of issue, um, you're always told to really work on meeting people where they are and connecting with the values they already have to meet the issue, whatever it is, like closing the whole power plant or anti-discrimination law or whatever. You want to connect that with the values they already have, right? So you're reaching your audience, you're reaching new people that are outside of your movement. So how have, this is for anyone up on the state, how do we, how do you apply that kind of strategy to this building new culture? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.